everybody I think I'm live yes I do think I'm live welcome 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 I'll give you all just a second to get settled in here and get connected thanks so much for joining me if you are in my live audience it's great to see you all there really appreciate it And in a moment, we'll jump into episode number 115. I trust everything is working correctly here as I just get myself situated so I can see all your comments and everything. Hope you're all having a lovely day today. And in a moment, we are going to start a story, of course, about Mr. Vincent Van Gogh that we can see here. This happens to be my all-time favorite self-portrait of his. It really just pops out at you. Absolutely extraordinary. Uh, let's see, just having a slight technical thing here to work out, no big deal. Great, Lisa Chorney says, we hear you loud and clear. Excellent, thank you for that, Lisa. Okay, well, let's get started, folks. I don't like to give the, the replay viewers in the future um, too long to wait. So uh, thank you, everybody, for being here live. I appreciate the turnout for sure. And this is a home edition because it's very wet weather. You may have seen out there on the Parisian weather forecast. It's insane. We've had one of the coldest, wettest uh, springtime seasons uh, ever, as far as I can recall. <clears throat> so today, what did I call this one, by the way? Visiting Van Gogh's last home. So welcome to this episode, everybody. We are going to, through a collection of photos that I took on location, and also um, some of Van Gogh's paintings, uh, of the area at that time. These are the fi the last paintings that he ever did, minus the one that we're looking at now. This is just a, a beautiful self-portrait to remind us of just how handsome this gent was. And I want to talk about a town called auvers sur oise It is just outside of Paris, about an hour's drive. And I know this might be a little little small on your screen, but you can see Paris down there in the bottom and then to the North northwest, we have Auvers sur Oise. Oise refer referring to the name of the river that runs through there. And th this was the final home, and still today is the final resting place of Vincent van Gogh. And so I wanted to talk about my trip there and what I've learned about his, his final days there and his very uh, creative days there, as well as his death. There's still some mystery surrounding his death. And of course, it's, um, it's a very intriguing and uh, albeit sad story. If you are watching me live, I want to remind you, you can fire off a super chat if you, if you are so inclined to do so. It's a great way to support this project. Otherwise, you'll find links in the description of this video, um, both live and on the replay, of various ways to support me through Patreon and PayPal and the merch store, etc., etc. So I really appreciate that. Great to see all these familiar names in the live audience. I'm feeling very grateful today, very relaxed here down in my basement. There's a pitter-patter of raindrops outside in the, in the yard. And I'm um, feeling good, feeling loose, feeling grateful for you all. So back to Van Gogh. And if I should mention, by the way, if you are not American, then I apologize in advance for my pronunciation of Van Gogh because I understand that um, he has one of those names that is literally pronounced differently in every single culture around the world. I saw a video once of people around the globe uh, pronouncing Van Gogh, and they all say it differently. From what I understand, and I know I'm going to butcher this, his actual real Dutch pronunciation is something like Van Gogh. Um, I'm sure that was probably off, but it's there's a there's a lot of guttural throat action if you want to try to pronounce his name correctly. And in France, as far as I can gather, they say something like Van Gogh, Van Gogh. But I'm just going to use the the plain old uh, Anglo version Van Gogh today. So I apologize if that grates your ears, and it just may if you're from another part of the world. Anyway, Auvers sur Oise is where he moved, and he. Why did he move to Auvers sur Oise? He was in the south of France. He had chopped off his ear already in Arles. He had gone into a mental health facility in the south of France, but then he decided to move north to the Paris region, which he had lived in before with his brother Theo. And we're going to talk about his brother Theo a fair amount today. And um, he also came here to Auvers to uh, seek psychiatric, psychi psychiatric treatment, easy for me to say. And so he is going to have a relationship with not only Theo in Paris, but with his um, psychiatrist by the name of Paul Gachet, or Dr. Gachet, as he's often referred to. So Vincent has to find a place to live in Auvers, 
The year is 1890. This is May of 1890. All of 131 years ago, uh, the Eiffel Tower would have been brand spanking new when Van Gogh moved to the Paris region. Thank you, Peggy Baker, for that super chat. I see that there. I really appreciate it. Liz Johnson says, I loved the city of Arles. Yeah, Liz, I haven't yet been able to visit Arles, and I certainly will um, seek out the footsteps of Van Gogh when I'm down there. So he gets there, <clears throat> May of 1890, where he would spend his final days. And the cheapest lodging that Van Gogh could find, or perhaps it was even his brother Theo, who often supported Vincent and helped um, pay his way and pay for his, his lodgings and lifestyle, was this. A little tiny inn in Auvergne called the Auberge Ravoux, named after the family that owned it, the Ravoux family. And it was uh, the cheapest room around. You could, for three and a half francs per day, you could get a room upstairs in the attic, plus three meals a day in the bistro on the ground floor. So you can visit this. Of course, it's one of the, the key monuments for tourists that go there looking for Van Gogh history. And uh, just right here in between the shutters, we can't really read it here, but uh, that is a plaque that reminds us Van Gogh lived and died in this building. And I popped in, I took some, again, just some snapshots. I never exactly planned to use these images as a proper uh, slideshow, but here we are. So this is the interior. I don't know if the colors of the walls were like this originally, but uh, I like to think that they were because it seems to fit very well into uh, Van Gogh's world and Van Gogh's palette, so to speak. Ah, Ellen says, I love this. Thanks, Ellen. Appreciate that. Lisa says, wow, I love this. Thanks, Lisa. I appreciate you. Just as another vertical shot. Now, you'll see this a little bit um, today. These chairs that are all through the town, I mean, just amazing. Aren't those perfect Van Gogh-esque chairs? And I would love to think that some of them are originals, but who knows at this point. I took a, 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 a focus shot on the flooring because this is actually the floor that Charlotte, my wife, chose for our first apartment that we purchased here in Paris. And she chose this design not because of Van Gogh, but because she loved the retro vintage feel of it. And of course, after we had already um, tiled our kitchen with this sort of tiles, it was pretty, pretty fun to say, hey, this is a Van Gogh's Bistro. I had the same floor. Who knew? Thanks, David Dubois. David says, uh, Corey, remember when you took me to Montmartre and showed me where Vincent van Gogh lived and I touched the blue door to his apartment building? That was surreal. Thanks, David, for that. I appreciate the support and, and I appreciate that, that memory that you're bringing up. Yes, absolutely. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, it's number 54 on the Rue Le Pic in Montmartre. If you're ever in the area, go check out number 54, Rue Le Pic. You can see the big blue door of where Vincent lived with his brother, Theo, which predated all of the story that we're talking about here. So again, this is another shot of the bistro, the... Uh, the zinc top bar, which would have been omnipresent in all the, the bars and bistros at the time. And then I um, I pulled off a um, good old panorama shot here. Gives you an idea. So this is where uh, Van Gogh in 1890 would have had his three meals a day. Apparently showed up for every single meal. Um, we'll talk about later at the end of the story of how one evening he did not show up for the meal at the bistro and everybody could kind of feel in their gut that something was off. But... That's for a little bit later. So upstairs in the attic, this is the, the old staircase that leads to the attic. There were several rooms. It was sort of a bed and breakfast. And Vincent's room was here, room number five up in the attic. Obviously very modest. That one skylight window you see is the only one in the space. It's completely empty now. It has remained untouched and unused since... Van Gogh's death. He actually died in this room, and we'll talk about that later. We'll, we'll get into the anecdotes and the details of um, how he passed. He happens to be buried here as well, and we'll talk about his tomb and what it felt like to visit that. Hey, Juan Yulo is in, in the chat here. Thanks, buddy. Thanks for the support. He says, bonjour, Quarry. I can't begin, can't begin the weekend without you and the Fritz. Oh, I appreciate that, Juan. You're such a great, great member of this community, and I know I'm not the only one who thinks so. So I was obsessed with being up here alone and taking... Now, there was a... If I recall, I think there was a, a guide who showed us up here, and then she said, no photos, no photos. But then she went downstairs and expected us to follow her. And um, I'm not ashamed to say um, I at least managed to whip my phone out and I grabbed a couple of naughty little pics. I mean, how can you not? How can you not? And I assume this would have been... Again, this is an attic room. So just a little closet here that he may have 
perhaps stored some of his clothes in and his painting supplies and just just the one chair there that's all now if we go back to this image actually this is plexiglass and i don't think it's protecting anything on the wall itself if i recall but i think that maybe they previously had put maybe a, an exhibit of some kind behind that plexiglass so if we make our way back downstairs again if you're just joining me live thank you this is uh Van Gogh's final days in the town of auvers sur oise about an hour's drive outside of Paris. You can take a train out there too. I think it's between two and three hours to train your way out there. Um, if you're interested in the description, I popped a link to an English language website that'll give you info about how to get to this town. And it's really the type of, really the type of visit where you go there and you, you just roam around. You've got your map of different locations related to Van Gogh. There's an absinthe museum. Uh, there's a chateau that you can visit. There's the house, I believe, of Dr. Gachet, the psychiatrist who treated Vincent. So this is back out in front of the inn, and I showed this because the Ravoux family, remember this is called the Auberge Ravoux, they would always sit out here on Sunday evenings um, in particular and just watch the world go by and drink and eat their dinner and whatnot. And of course they had their local customers that would come in, the, the, the local cast of characters. And the, the Ravoux family had uh, a few kids, at least one, um, a 13-year-old girl by the name of Adeline. And what I wanted to do uh, today on this episode is show you not only photos that I took during my visit, but intersperse them with plenty of paintings of Van Gogh's um, during that time, during the same exact period that he would stay. And so the Adeline, the 13-year-old daughter of the owners, uh, was painted three times by Van Gogh, and I wanted to share those with you. So we're going to get a good, a good eyeful of Vincent's work today. So this is Adeline. Two almost identical poses, but uh, I'll give you the, the back and forth just to give you an idea of the difference in how he handles the, the gesture and the, the color here. But the same, same pose. And this is another shot, um, another canvas of Adeline, the daughter. Apparently Vincent was very amicable and very friendly and very polite to everyone. And uh, as far as I can tell, everybody that crossed his path including um, Adeline and the family at the inn. They all thought that Vincent was um, a very charming and polite and kind fellow. Right across the inn, you will find the, the Hotel de Ville, or the, the little town hall of auvers sur oise And what's interesting is a couple of times, on the, a few different times in this episode, I can give you a side-by-side -side of, of my photo and, and what Van Gogh painted. This happened to be, perhaps you can see it, this was a 14 juillet, their Independence Day, so there was a bit of decoration. But uh, if you're like me, you love pairing together, you know, the modern day and the, and the paintings themselves. I can never get enough of that. Hey, Haas is here live. It's great to see you, Haas. Natalie Hayes, so great to see you. Hi, Lauren. Hi, Lauren Poffenberger. Andrea Miles and Jean and Linda. It's great to see you all here. Thank you. I hope for some of you this will, this virtual visit will be a, um, a nice discovery, and then for others, maybe it'll be a nice memory uh, if you've already been there. So let's go to just some, some snaps I took of walking around Auvers. And then I'll show you some more paintings that he did. As you can imagine, this is perhaps a little bit akin to visiting a, a town like, like Giverny, uh, where Monet lived because it's very quaint and quiet. And it doesn't get too overrun by tourists, especially this, even, even less so than Giverny, for sure. But everything's very old, old stone. There's a beautiful uh, Romanesque church that we'll talk about too, that Vincent painted. Ah, John Wood says, Corey, I have the same picture of Vincent's room. Now, despite Vincent's obvious mental health decline toward the end, he was extremely prolific during his final days here at Auvers. He spent 70 days in this town before he passed away, and during that 70 days, he painted almost 80 pictures. 
And I can tell you, as I'm going to show you in the slideshow, I'm going to show you just a sampling of those 80, but uh, there are almost no throwaways. They're just all so, so great and uh, really adds a bit of sadness to the story, the fact that it got, obviously got cut off so short. So here are some more paintings of the, the countryside. So we had a lot of cottages and trees and um, a lot of wheat fields and gardens, flowers, stone walls. And it was uh, right up his alley, so to speak. No pun intended. Obviously, it helped to keep Vincent, uh, the painting helped to keep his mind clear and calm and focused. And not a day went by without Vincent uh, packing up his easel and his folding stool and his brushes, his palette, and going out to paint on site. He did it literally every single day, weather permitting. All the while, his younger brother Theo, who will certainly be part of our story, uh, was checking in. He, Theo was living in Paris as an art dealer in the, in the art world and always, always a great proponent and a great ally and a great cheerleader for Van Gogh here, trying desperately to get his paintings known and sold so that Vincent could support himself, which sadly never really happened. Um, famously, Van Gogh only sold one painting, as they say, in his lifetime. And so Theo would check in and make sure that his older brother was, was hanging in there. Um, that relationship between the two brothers is really at the heart of Vincent van Gogh's story. And many letters between the two of them over the years really offer just an invaluable documentation of what was going through Vincent's mind in particular. Otherwise, we would have lost a lot of the insight into what his life was like and, and how he was, um, what he thought of various periods in his life. Those letters are... are like I said, very invaluable. Thanks, Pam Moore, for the support in the comments. I see you there. Appreciate you. Um, Theo, his brother, had tremendous sy sympathy for his brother's mental um, struggles, but also truly believe believed in Vincent's genius. Uh, he saw it before anyone else did. And shortly before Vincent died, uh, Theo had a baby boy. And Theo named his baby boy Vincent. So you can you can really feel the love when you consider that even while Vincent was still alive, his brother Theo has a baby and decides to name it after his, his big brother. Again, these are all paintings that we're seeing of, of Vincent's time in Auvergne in 1890. I don't know this for sure, but I always assume that he did the, uh, the vases and the flowers when it was a rainy day and he couldn't get out on the fields. But look at these, my goodness. I mean, we could spend a half hour on every single, the, every single slide. I hope you're enjoying them, the, the reds here. You know, a painting like this, I adore this, this color. So many things go through my mind when I look at Van Gogh's work. First of all, it always surprised me. It always, no matter what I'm prepared for, it always impresses me further than, than what I expect. And so that, I think that's one sign of just a, a master. And you look at this red and you think, wow, he's so good at using this red. But then you look at another painting and you say, he's so good at using yellows. And then he's so good at using blues. He's so good at oranges, etc. And uh, there's something about the, the combinations of colors that he, he, just, he just knew it. Whether he, whether he was aware of it or not, consciously, he absolutely had an incredible sense for this. So his brother Theo's checking in and making sure he's doing okay day to day, but also um, Vincent's having regular meetings with this gentleman, who I mentioned earlier, Paul Gachet, or Dr. Gachet, who lived in the area and was tasked with um, keeping track of Vincent and helping him in a psychiatry um, sense, psychiatric sense. At first, the relationship between Vincent and Dr. Gachet was a bit rough. I think Vincent had off and on relationships with, with everybody, including his brother. Um, but two portraits, um, painted portraits of Dr. Gachet were done by Vincent. And this is interesting um, to note because Dr. Gachet is going to be one of the few people who's at Vincent's uh, side, at his bedside, when he dies. Gachet also had a wife called Marguerite. And by the way, before we move on from uh, Dr. Gachet, you should know that if you happen to be in Père Lachaise Cemetery and you've got a map on you, you can find uh, Gachet's tomb at Père Lachaise as well. So Vincent also painted the wife of Gachet named Marguerite. Here she is at the piano. And 
then here's a beautiful, oh my goodness, this is uh, Dr. Gachet's home with his wife Marguerite by Van Gogh. Dr. Gachet was uh, a doctor, but he was an art lover as well, and a friend to many Impressionists like Renoir and Cezanne and Manet. He was also an amateur art artist himself, um, Gachet. In fact, sketched a portrait of Van Gogh uh, on his deathbed that I'll, show, I'll share with you, done by the, the doctor himself. Thanks, Ginny. I see your support there in the comments. She says, I'm loving this. Vincent is a favorite of mine. Yeah, me too. Uh, I always feel so fortunate when I can go to the Musée d'Orsay, for example, here in Paris and, and see when you see, see the stuff in person. Uh, it's a cliche, but you really do have to see these in person to fully appreciate them. So onward, some more images of Auvers sur Oise, taken by myself. Sharon Peterson, Sharon Peterson says that this town was a sort of pilgrimage for her. She highly recommends visiting it as a day trip outside of Paris, yeah. Some good classic French shutter action. So you can see the date there, 1598. I guess it can give us a, a clue as to how old some of these structures are. Heather Jackson says, I cried when I saw his artwork in person. Yeah, I get that. Totally get that. We're coming up on the church of the town, known as, perhaps not surprisingly, Notre Dame uh, dauvers sur -Oise. Our Lady, Notre Dame. This is the back of it. Now, if you position yourself at the back of the church just right, you can compare it with one of, certainly one of Van Gogh's most famous paintings of this period, the back of Notre Dame. Thanks, Lois. Hi, I really appreciate the support. She says, loving this, Corey. Ah, oh, thank you. Sending you a virtual hug, Lois. So this is, as you can see, the photo I took, uh, I tried my best to, I must have had the, an image of the painting in my hand because I tried my best to get exactly the same perspective with the, the relationships of all the little rooftops uh, to each other. You can even see the, the same fork in the road. What a, what a thrill to stand, to stand here. So this episode's bringing back good memories for me as well. This church will come back to us in the story um, a little bit later, but I'll show you some more images that I took here. I think this was later in the day when the, the sunset was coming. But Thanks, John Woods. He says, I have seen many Van Gogh's paintings in many museums, and I love this today. Ah, thanks, John. I appreciate that. So this is church, the, the local church you can visit. Um, I didn't double check this, but clearly there are some Gothic elements. I would say this is Romanesque into early Gothic, if, uh, if you twisted my arm. Ah, oh, thanks. Phyllis Cartwright's here. She says, beautiful recreation, Corey. You can see the church is elevated. I'm a sucker for a good church. Um, here, some more, and I'll show you some more shots from the area. This is just me wandering around, and then I'll show you some more paintings by Vincent. Look at this tree, how the, the ivy grows all the way up the trunk like that. I like this little courtyard. I wanted to have a, a drink at that little table. Thanks, Nancy Brisson. Appreciate the support. She says, this is wonderful, Corey. Merci. I appreciate you, Nancy. So like I said, there's also um, an absinthe museum that I wouldn't, I wouldn't exactly call it a 10 out of 10, but you should check it out. It's interesting. Um, you can visit the inn, of course, where Vincent lived. You can visit 
uh, go see the house of Dr. Gachet. You can see a chateau in the, the area that has exhibits, if, I don't, if I'm not mistaken. You can see there almost sort of ramparts set up. Clearly there you can see the leftovers of the chateau. And then this, uh, I want to show you another side-by-side -side comparison of a painting. This is an intersection where one of his paintings was done. And um, I want you to note here on the right-hand side that there is a staircase that winds its way up the hill on this side and also a, a doorway over there toward the left. Because if you view it from this angle, you get the doorway on the left and then this faint little staircase that snakes its way up the hill. And uh, you'll see here another beautiful painting from that period. And you can, again, see that the staircase going up here and then the door is just right here. And let's dive right back into some of Vincent's paintings in Auvers. So I mentioned earlier that Auvers sur Oise means Auvers on the Oise River, and this is that river. Look at the composition. Talk about a master of composition with that, that final boat stretching across almost the entire foreground. It's just so good, so good. I would say that composition is probably the thing that I'm drawn to the most visually when I'm enjoying paintings, and uh, I really feel like Van Gogh nails it almost 100% of the time. Speaking of which, look at this next slide here. I hope, well, I'm, I'm trying not to go too fast either because I know it's, you, you can spend so much time getting lost in these beautiful colors and the, the brush strokes, but look at this. Look at the composition here where he puts the horizon so high up but you really feel like almost like every tree there is exactly where it needs to be for for the design of this picture just stunning wow again he spent 70 days here and did almost 80 paintings i know i speak for a lot of us out out there a lot of you that if i could just pull off one of these paintings in a month or two or six. <laughs> it would be quite an accomplishment. And the whole while, he, of course, famously just didn't think that he was quite nailing it. He didn't, certainly nobody cared enough to, to buy anything or to give him a show. A lot of fields, a lot of hay fields and haystacks, and of course we know that Vincent was wont to, um, to paint that. But he had a knack, didn't he, for finding colors that fit uh, harmoniously with each other. This is a fun, uh, I guess you could call it a bit of a, a detour. I remember when I was uh, in art school, I always avoided trying to paint animals like horses and cattle and things like that because the, if you don't get the angles right, if you don't get the lines right of the legs, for example, they look ridiculous and fake. But um, no problem for Vincent here. He was more than capable. These are, a lot of these are just, these next ones are, they're portraits, but they're titled peasant woman or lady in, in the field. And so um, I don't know that she, it's anyone in particular. But clearly you'll see her face here and in the next slide it seems to be the same lady and it may even be in the next one as well now in the next one i'm going to show you it's a portrait of perhaps the same woman um, in my opinion has a very toulouse lautrec vibe to it now toulouse lautrec would have been obviously doing his thing at the same time in paris and moulin rouge uh, and the same this is 1890 it's right in um, toulouse lautrec's wheelhouse so to speak and toulouse lautrec every now and then would do paintings where these where the skin tones would have that greenish glow. And um, I feel like this, they, they were friends. Uh, they knew each other, these two artists. So I wouldn't be surprised if Vincent was quite a chameleon in many ways and would absorb the styles and try out things that he saw in his friend's work. And so I just, just 
I mean, come on, you could just live your life right here in these, the way that these, this blue plays off of the yellows into the orange and almost sort of a red color. And then the fact he's going complementary colors there, but then here in the background, to not add so much contrast, he goes with um, rather analogous colors of the sort of yellows and the greens. Wow. Just mm. delicious. Hope you're enjoying this. Hope you've got a, a tasty beverage by your side, maybe a cafe creme or maybe a glass of wine for those of you who are in the right time zone. This one here was interesting. I thought, um, well, what happened here? Did he intentionally scratch the canvas or something? And then I found that the title was simply something like Fields in the Rain or uh, Rainy Day in Auvergne or something like that. So he's just, um, he's, de he's depicting a rainstorm. And then that brings us to this one. And this is a notable painting because it's believed that this field somewhere in this area is where he committed suicide, his suicide attempt. And I want to touch upon this story because it's intriguing. It's also a bit mysterious because they still don't know exactly what happened. He was alone out in the field. He would go out every day. And nobody knew exactly where he was, but he'd come home for dinner each night at that at the inn. And uh, he was just 37 years old. Imagine that. Everything we've seen, all this amazing work, um, for a just a very young 37-year-old guy. So it's the evening, late July, 1890, just a couple of months after moving here. And the official story is that Vincent is out painting in these fields, he at some point decides to set his easel down against a haystack, remove a pistol from his easel, or perhaps from his vest, aims for his own heart, and pulls the trigger. He happened to miss his heart, and um, a bit low in his stomach. He faints, falls down, comes to, uh, regains consciousness, gets back up, and starts staggering home, falling down three more times in the process. That evening, if we go back to the inn, the Auberge Ravoux, where he was living up in the attic. I never, by the way, looking at this now, just I'm realizing, I never figured out while I was there if this is the skylight that shines into his room. Remember that one window that he had? I don't know. That may be the case. So remember Adeline, the 13-year-old girl that he painted, and, and the whole family, it's, it's a Sunday evening, and they're all out here. They're at this table, as they would do as business wrapped up on Sundays. And they expected Vincent to come back, and the fact that he didn't, um, everybody knew that something must have been wrong. So finally, Vincent comes back. He, he comes staggering back in front of this, um, in front of the table here, in front of the inn, and they ask him if he's okay. He's clenching his stomach, and he mumbles something incoherently and tries to pretend that he's all right, and he stumbles his way up the stairs. But of course, they're concerned. So Mr. Ravu, the, the father, um, listens and hears that um, he hears some noises from. Vincent's room and decides he's going to go up and see what's happening. Uh, so he comes up to the room, and I assume the bed would be here, and he finds Vincent curled up in the fetal position with his gunshot wound. And when he asks what happened, Vincent says, I tried to uh, kill myself. So Dr. Gachet immediately alerted, and younger brother Theo immediately alerted. He's in Paris, and he rushes in as soon as he can. And those are the two gentlemen who essentially would be by Vincent's side here in this room for the two days it would take for him to eventually pass away. Um, he claimed the suicide was deliberate and he had a completely clear mind. He wasn't having one of his psychotic episodes. And in fact, when Dr. Gachet was trying to fix him up and told Vincent that he intended to save his life, apparently Vincent said, well, if you do, then I'll just have to do it all over again. So sadly, he was very determined to end his life. There are theories as to why. Uh, some people think that it might be because his brother Theo had a family now and perhaps had shown signs of not being able to fully financially support Vincent like he had been like he had done in the in the past and so maybe Vincent felt like his future was looking rather bleak. But uh, that was two agonizing days um, here with Vincent on the bed smoking his pipe by the way. He refused to stop smoking his tobacco in his pipe 
which of course the doctor told him to stop and Theo told him to stop, but Vincent said, no, 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 I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to smoke my pipe. Maybe it was one of the few pleasures that he had in those last two days. Thank you so much, Mike. Tremendous support in the Super Chats. Um, I really appreciate that. Thank you. Really appreciate you. So, essentially, the two days later, it's the end of July, 1890, and, and Vincent passes away in his brother's arms, in his younger brother's arms. Before we move on to the story, uh, with the rest of the story, I took this photo, but because it was rather dark, my camera didn't handle some of the shots, and I found that when I came back, I had this. And I wanted to share it because for me, it seems very fitting. There's something about how it's off kilter and out of focus, obviously, that to me just really feels like it, somehow it ties into the spirit. And sometimes you have those happy accidents where you take a photo that's unintentional, but it's enough that I wanted to, to share it with you in addition to the others. Um, I mentioned that Dr. Gachet was an amateur artist in his own right, and he sketched this, presum presu presumably at the moment of death uh, of Vincent. So this writing here says to Theo, it was a gift to Theo. And this would have been the ear, the left ear, that would have been um, cut off. So I don't know if this represents an ear per se, but perhaps what was left. Incidentally, I heard, I had always assumed that it was just a little bit of the ear lobe, uh, not that big a deal. But in researching this episode in particular, I came across evidence and museum exhibits and whatnot that claim that, no, it was, a, it was essentially the, almost the entire ear. Thanks, Mona Chipman. She says, cannot wait to be back in Paris and have you as a guide to this great city. I appreciate that, Mona. Thanks so much. So, Vincent dies, everyone is alerted. The casket is placed on the ground floor of the inn. Now, this is the dining room of the inn. I don't believe that the wake took place here, but in another room, I believe it was called the painter's room, um, that would have been on this ground floor as far as I can uh, surmise. But the reception of the wake and the gathering of the, the people and whatnot um, would have certainly, they would have spent time here in this dining room. And uh, the casket was placed on the ground floor, covered with a simple white cloth, surrounded by um, bouquets of yellow flowers to honor his favorite color, yellow, including lots of sunflowers, of course, which he famously painted, and other yellow flowers all surrounding his casket. His most re recent paintings were hung on the walls all around him, so I, I read it was described almost as a halo surrounding Vincent's body of all the recent paintings he had done in Auvergne, including, I assume, many that we've seen today. Um, and also his um, easel and his folding stool that he would use and his palette and brushes were placed on the floor next to the casket. Quite a fair number of people came to pay their respects, 20 or 30 folks. Um, a lot of artists came in from, from Paris, uh, locals that he had befriended. Again, I mentioned he left a very friendly and kind impression on most of the locals that he, that he knew here, and so they, they all were feeling very sorrowful. And uh, out of the artists that came to visit, Pissarro, the Impressionist, would have been the most known. Toulouse-Lautrec wanted to come, but turns out he got the um, funeral announcement too late. So he didn't have time to make it. But uh, Toulouse-Lautrec would have been here. Uh, it was a, a tremendous showing of support, everybody trying to console uh, Theo, the younger brother. Also, Père Tanguy was there. If you're familiar with the story of Van Gogh, Père Tanguy had a, a shop in Paris where he sold Vincent his art supplies and also hung Vincent's paintings in the front window to try to help the artist out. He was a big supporter and also had his portrait painted by Van Gogh, Père Tanguy. So he happened to be there as well. Uh, later, in, in reference to the outpouring of support at the funeral, Theo his brother said, if Vincent could have seen the love and sympathy for him at that moment, he wouldn't have wanted to die. Which you got to imagine would be true. Thanks, Bonnie Torgoville and Lisa Chorney. Lisa says, great episode. I love Van Gogh, and now I want to go to Auvers-sur-Oise. Merci, Corey. Thank you, Lisa and Bonnie. I appreciate you both. So then the procession leads to the small cemetery where you can vi visit Vincent's tomb. 
Theo's original intention when he was printing out all of the funeral announcements to send to everyone, he wanted the funeral service to take place in that church that I showed you, in Notre Dame of Auvers. And this is the announcement. However, sadly, the priest of that church said, I refuse to allow the service to happen inside the inside this um, place of worship because it was a suicide. And also, as I understand it, um, Van Gogh was Protestant. So for those two reasons, the priest refused. So if you can see, if, if it's blown up enough on your screen here, you can see right here it says, Église au vert sur oise, but it's crossed out. So poor Theo, he's already grieving for his big brother having died. And he's printing out these announcements and then has to go in by hand and scratch out. And every, every announcement has to go by hand and scratch out the church because the priest won't allow a suicide victim to, to be honored. So the procession with the 20 or so artists and friends and locals following the casket, um, the procession makes its way here to the local cemetery of Auvers. And here I just, these are a couple of my shots that I popped up here. It's a rather modest and small cemetery. And then you come across this. Speaking of modest and small. Here lies Vincent van Gogh, just, uh, as I said, 37 years old. One attendee wrote that the weather that day was really a hot, blistering, sunny day. And he said it made, it, it made the, the, the burial all the more sad because the hot sun and the bright blue sky against the yellow wheat fields essentially created a perfect Van Gogh style of day, the, the perfect um, type of day that Van Gogh would have, would have enjoyed painting. And uh, Theo, it was reported that during the burial, as they're lowering Vincent into the ground, Theo, the brother, was, of course, very distraught. Um, in a letter to his sister later, Theo wrote, People must know that he was a great artist, which often goes hand in hand with being a great man. In time, he will be recognized, and there will be many who regret that he left us so soon. What's even more moving is when you visit Van Gogh's tomb, what is in fact right next to it, because Theo, just six months after Vincent died, Theo passes away as well, age 33, leaving behind a, a wife and a little baby boy, who, by the way, was named Vincent after the artist. And many said that um, Theo died simply of the, the sorrow and the sadness of his big brother passing away. So when you visit Vincent's tomb, what you see right next door, right next to it, is Theo. What happened is Theo dies six months after Vincent and is buried locally. Um, but then his wife, all the way, many years later in 1914, Theodore's wife decides to relocate her husband's body and put him, put the brothers together in Auvers. And it's uh, incredibly touching when you think about the relationship that they had. And I think about this a lot because I do have two brothers. I'm the older brother of four. And I think about what it must have been like for Theo to see his older brother, the person you tend to look up to and look for guidance and look for a you know, as a role model, but then seeing that that person is essentially falling apart and not able to take care of themselves, uh, but then you do your best bending over backwards and spending as much money as you can get a hold of to try to keep your, your big brother um, just in a, in, you know, in a state of doing okay. This ivy that you see here is thanks to Dr. Gachet, who took ivy from his own father's garden and covered the two tombs so that they would be combined into one. Now, for many, many years, it was believed that Vincent, uh, bizarrely, had never painted a portrait of his brother Theo, despite their close relationship and the fact that they lived together at various times. Uh, but as recently as 20, 2011, they found that one of the self-portraits that they believed was of Vincent was, in fact, uh, of Theo, because they looked so alike. So I came across this. This is, uh, was believed to be two self-portraits. But the one on the right, apparently, is Vincent, and then the one on the left, they've determined, was in fact a portrait of, of Theo. So it's a very, very rare look at Theo Van Gogh, as seen by his brother on the left. So it's a, always a very touching story. 
uh, when I consider Van Gogh's life and certainly his death. Now to finish here, um, there's one last wrinkle to this story because it's never been officially proven what happened to Vincent. He had, you know, what people around him said happened, and then he had what he claimed happened, but it, not everybody believes that. Some people, there are theories that it, the death was in fact an accident, or maybe he was intentionally shot by someone else but didn't dare to say so. Most recently, uh, some of you may have seen a, a movie with Willem Dafoe as he's portraying Van Gogh. It's called At Eternity's Gate. And at the end, that movie chose to show the version of the story where local children who weren't fans of Van Gogh and would harass him uh, came and mess was they were messing with him one day and uh, there was an accidental shooting uh, at the hands of the children. That has never been proven. It was a theory that was floated out there. Some people think it's complete, complete bunk. Uh, other people, again, we don't know exactly. But the reason I mention that is because this story is from the 1890s. And if we fast forward to the 1960s, many decades later, there is a worker out in the fields of auvers sur oise and he's tilling up the, the soil and he finds this. He finds an old rusted revolver and the experts uh, try to date it according to the deterioration of it. And they determine that it must have been buried in the ground right around the late 1800s, which would put it right, of course, directly into the story of Van Gogh's suicide or perhaps his, his murder. And um, what's more is apparently the small caliber, caliber of this rifle would also make sense, the fact that he could be shot and he wouldn't die right away. You know, he'd be, he, he could um, survive for a couple of days before it, he, over, he was overcome by the wound. So that's interesting. This is um, in a museum. I, in the Van Gogh Museum, perhaps? I, I should have Googled, um, found out where this was. Uh, so I apologize for that. But believe it or not, that it's an interesting wrinkle that they actually found a gun out there where, in likely the same location. So still a rather unsolved mystery. Thanks, Mike Slater. I appreciate the support. And Lisa Viafor, thanks so much to all of you. And there you have it, back to the self-portrait. So that's the story as I see it of Vincent's final days, his last 70 days or so, just outside of Paris, in auvers sur -Oise. I hope you enjoyed that. And uh, if you ever get a chance to go out there, I, I highly suggest it. You could make a day trip out of it, or you could certainly spend a night there and uh, make sure that you hit all the sites. And uh, I think it's an interesting story to contemplate. Certainly a character that we'll never get tired of talking about. So thanks, everybody. I really want to appreciate, I really want to thank you, rather, for joining me on this episode 115. Thanks, Andrea Freak and Miles. She says, Corey, amazing presentation. Merci. Oh, I appreciate that. Thanks, Camilla Fennell. Thank you so much. That's really lovely. I won't be able to do a, a cafe chat today, sadly, but uh, maybe next time around. So I wish you all a wonderful rest of your day. Again, uh, if you're not currently a Patreon member, or if you haven't checked out the merchandise store, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, you find all those links down in the description. <laughs> Lois says, after every episode, Corey, I say this one was the best. Oh, I appreciate this. Oh, Nancy says one of your best. Thanks, everybody. I really appreciate that. I'm, I am really feeling the love here. Thanks so much. Uh, okay, you know that I'm one for really long, drawn-out goodbyes, and I'm going to try to not do that this time. But again, thank you so much and have a wonderful rest of your day. And if you're watching out there in the, in the distant future on the replay, thanks so much for that as well. Please go ahead and give it a, a thumbs up. That definitely helps the algorithm spread it around. And I look forward to sharing something else with you, either from, from home or from, from the streets of Paris. Oh my goodness, Jennifer Robinson coming in there right at the end with a very generous a bit of support there. Thank you, Jen. I really miss you. Thanks, Margaret C. She says, fabulous. For, what a great episode. Merci, Corey. This is so great. I, I think I'm just going to chill out here and bask in all the, <laughs> the love. I really appreciate it, folks. You're all so, so lovely. Okay, everybody. Thank you so much for sticking with it, and I will catch you on the next one. Bye-bye.